Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I'm Dr. Carrie Bedian at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, and I'm joined by my fantastically fabulous and feisty female friends, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. Hey, everybody. And Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello. And we are joined again by Dr. Mark Ratner, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Theralogic. So we are happy to see you back, Mark. Nice to be here. And thank you for uh, taking time out of your, what turns out to be sounding like an extraordinarily busy weekend as you guys are planning to move. Yeah, we are um, We're in the process of packing up uh, yeah. a home we've lived in for 33 years and um, takes a lot of discipline because at first you's like, you're like, oh, I, I don't want to throw that out. And then eventually it's like, okay, <laughs> In the trash. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. you have to dis you have to discipline yourself and uh, sort through years and years worth of stuff. And yeah, so it's it's a busy time. I have to sure. say, I I'm very impressed that you've been in the same house for 33 years because it, and maybe it's just been the way I feel like my life has been, with the exception of the house that I'm in now. It's the first house I've ever moved into that I didn't have an exit plan when I moved in. Uh huh. Uh, I. I, I guess I, I feel lucky about that because I, you know, I grew up up in uh, New York. I trained, I did my med school and residency down in New Orleans. And then right out of New Orleans came up here to the Washington DC area um, and been here ever since. Um, and uh, yeah, we, I guess we have a tendency to just sort uh, of stay where we are um, exactly. my wife so, and I do so. so Mark are you moving or downsizing I mean I know you're moving so we're, are you we're moving down, yeah downsizing? we're downsizing we're gonna move to a condo um so oh, be one, on one floor be nice yeah and I was explaining a moment ago um our daughter um and her husband and our grandkids are in Baltimore um which is just about 40 minutes north of here so we're gonna yeah. condo a little closer to them to them oh, nice and um yeah so that's so, that's so you have to make big decisions, not just like, am I going to keep this thing that I, you know, stir stuff with my kitchen stuff, but you're like, am I going to keep that piece of furniture? Am I going to sell it? Am I going to give it away? That's oh, tough. Yeah. That's yeah, really yeah, hard. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And by down, when we, when you downsize, you know, you got a lot of stuff. What am I going to do with this stuff? Yeah. Uh, and of course the, my kids are like, um, well, we don't want it right now, but maybe we'd want it in the yeah. future. So you know, then like, you gotta go now. storage. It's like uh yeah. the whole world that exists to deal with this stuff for uh oh, yeah. Yeah, for people Well, a lot of times when you're on the receiving end of that stuff, because my mother died a few years ago and my sister's still storing most of that in her basement because I'm kinda like your kids. I'm like, Well, I want it, but I don't really have a place to put it. And so, right. you know. Right. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, and they're it's tough. It's challenging. They're still kind of making their way too. So, anyway, yeah, busy weekend. <laughs> well, good luck. Thank uh, you. What kind of questions do we have today? Okay, so our question for today is: Hello, I am thirty-three, AMH one point four, with an almost two-year-old, conceived naturally after a chemical pregnancy and seven months of trying. Trying to conceive for baby number two has proven more difficult. After nine months of trying, saw REI, found a polyp, um, re removed it by hysteroscopy. They also believe my left tube is blocked, same tube that my son was conceived. Since the polyp removal, we tried three rounds of five micro milligrams of letrozole. During the third cycle, we did a mid-cycle ultrasound and saw three mature eggs. I also did Avidrol trigger for the last cycle. Still no luck, and we are about to start our fourth monitored cycle with letrozole and Avidrol. My question is how many more cycles until we progress to IVF? We would like two more kids. My husband's sperm tested normal. Well, most data suggest if you're gonna do fertility treatment with oral medicine and IUI, really about three or four cycles is all we generally recommend. I mean, certainly I think a long time ago, we were worried that if you continued, it may have caused a health concern, like you know, increase your risk of cancer. I think that's kind of fallen a little bit by the wayside now. But it's just if you try it for more than three or four tries and you haven't been successful, then chances are, you know, the fifth, sixth or seventh time is, is not going to be helpful either. So usually at that point, I would at least regroup, meet with your reproductive endocrinologist and just talk about kind of what the options are. But I think they're probably going to say IVF is probably the route to go at this point. 
I, I would comment that I don't think she actually has been doing IUI with these. I think she's been oh. doing letrozole with timed intercourse. And okay. unless you had unless you have anovulatory infertility, so you're not ovulating on a regular basis, I think the data really supports that using ovulation induction medicines like letrozole um, with IUI are going to give you mm -hmm. better chances of pregnancy. I would give that one or two chances. Um, and if you're not pregnant, probably in two cycles, especially considering everything you've already done, then I would strongly consider IVF. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all that. I mean, if you wanted to do some additional sperm testing to look at the function, you can consider that. Um, just because if it happens to be low, you may decide to jump ship earlier and move to IVF, but I would probably not spend a whole lot of extra time, um, on, on just ovulation induction by itself, or even ovulation induction with IUI, a couple more and then, and then call it. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right. So looking at our topic of the day, and we are always excited to have Mark here so that we can get all of the in-depth uh, information and all the things that we, we know, but we don't really deeply know. Um, and so we're going to talk about some, some vitamins, some supplements today, um, particularly starting with melatonin. And so this is one that has started to get a little bit more traction recently, but what's why, why is it getting traction and what are the, what is melatonin and why is, is melatonin? And, yeah. Yeah. So, so melatonin is a hormone that we make in our brain. Um, and most people are familiar with melatonin as a sleep aid, um, mm -hmm. because when it gets dark out, um, the brain secretes melatonin and you get sleepy. Uh, and so people, and there's good studies that document the ability of taking, uh, uh, someone who takes a melatonin supplement at bedtime will fall asleep more easily. Um, doesn't Ooh. do such a good job keeping you asleep. Okay. Mm. Um, but it, it will help you fall asleep. Um, interestingly though, uh, it turns out melatonin, melatonin's ability to make you sleepy and to, to kind of help the body get tired and go to sleep. That's just one of the things it does. It has a whole host of other functions um, that are just starting to be fully understood. One of which appears to be that it improves egg quality. Um, mm. And so there are studies showing uh, that uh, melatonin supplementation can improve uh, egg quality. There's also some studies that show that it's uh, really effective, uh, has some benefit in women with PCOS. Um, so the challenge with melatonin, uh, obviously, is finding out the right dose. There's a somewhat of a mistaken tendency uh, in terms of like just the sleep function. People will take five milligrams or 10 milligrams of melatonin at bedtime. Uh, and yet the studies really show that the best effect in terms of sleep is just if you take two milligrams. You don't need that much. Uh, and it may actually be a counterproductive to take higher doses. Um, but so so there's increasing data on the benefits of melatonin, not only in um, egg quality and sleep, but immune response. Um, you know, back uh, during COVID, um, there was a pretty good body of evidence showing that melatonin uh, improved the immune response and reduced the risk of what they called cytokine storm, uh, an overreactive uh, immune response to the COVID infection. Mm. Um, I remember back when um, then President Trump was hospitalized, there was a, a news story where they showed the list of medications he was being given at Walter Reed. And one of them was melatonin. And mm. uh, people initially assumed, oh, well, just they're giving him that so he can get some sleep at night. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it was because of its, of its uh, benefits in the immune response. Um, so melatonin's definitely an interesting supplement. So let's kind of break this up and let, let's start with melatonin and egg quality. Do we have any information about how that works and when and how long you might need to take this to have some effect? Um, those kinds of studies have not really been done, you know, where, you know, dose finding uh, or let's try treating for two months versus six months versus a year. Um you know, most people, I think, in terms of supplementing to improve egg quality, kind of make the assumption that a two to three month 
um, mm -hmm. time. Kind of uh, like with DHEA. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, DHEA, CoQ10, th those those are typically the intervals that are, have been used in the studies. Um, in terms of mechanism of action, uh, it's it's really just first being understood. Melatonin has antioxidant effects. Um, it, it's got a, a wide range of benefits uh, besides just the sleep benefit. Uh, interesting, though, there was a study published probably about two years ago um, that I think they went out and they bought about 20 different melatonins um, and had them tested. And uh, like 80 percent of them um, did not contain were not content accurate. And a significant percentage of them had were adulterated with kind of crazy stuff like serotonin um, hmm. and uh, other other hormones. So you have to look for independently content certified products if you're going to take something like that, especially uh, during a like a trying to conceive time frame. OK, um, and there's really there's two different programs you can look for. One is USP. That's U.S. Pharmacopeia. Mm -hmm. And that's a little logo that would be on the bottle. And the other is NSF. Um, and that way, you know that you're getting what you think you're getting. Uh, real important. So what Mark's kind of mentioning is that um, vitamins and supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So you have to look for these other designations on your vitamin or supplement bottle to know that they've actually been independently tested. So you know you're getting what you think you're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's another, you know, one of the new hot supplements is berberine. I'm not sure if you're familiar or if <laughs> you've heard of it. Are you familiar with berberine at all? No, no but I have another question about melatonin before we move on. Okay. Um, so a, go ahead. a couple of years at our national meeting, Sarah Berga and her niche is kind of um, in hypothalamic amenorrhea. I remember her talking about melatonin and actually she said she would not recommend melatonin because she thought that it, or there were some studies to show that it inhibited um, the secretion of estrogen, particularly in people with hypothalamic amenorrhea. And I don't really know if she knew the mechanism or if there were great studies on that, but is that anything that you're aware of or know about? Not I'm not. I've been a little hesitant to give melatonin for that reason to people. Yeah, I'm hmm. not familiar with that. I think the best data on melatonin is in women with PCOS, um, and I should say the the most studies have been done. Um, and uh, but I'm not really familiar with the whole endocrine axis uh, issue that you you know that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I in the past have have been hesitant about melatonin, and and I'm I'm loving. I want to hear about the PCOS version of this, mm -hmm. but I. I when I was trained, um, I remember the the internal medicine endocrinologist, so not the reproductive endocrinologist, but the medicine endocrinologist actually discouraged us from using it during pregnancy um, because it could potentially affect like in utero development of the pineal gland and things like that. So I mm -hmm. I don't know any data beyond that. It, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that it's kind of like, you know, is it, is it good? Is it not? But maybe kind of while we're in preparation, something to consider, but tell us, tell us about the PCOS part of it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the PCOS studies have, have been done using melatonin, both alone, uh, and also in conjunction in combination, um, with metformin or inositols. Um, and it, it, it appears to enhance the, um, the insulin sensitization that you get from either mm -hmm. metformin, uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, inositols, uh, improves egg quality, um, in women with PCOS, uh, and, uh, reduces testosterone levels. It, it enhances the effect that you get from, um, in other words, I don't think there's too many studies looking at it in isolation for mm -hmm. PCOS. They've been combination uh, interventions. It, so when, when we're looking at, uh, comments about egg quality in, in these various patient groups, is that looking at improving aneuploidy? Is that looking at improving maturity? Is that looking at improving the uh, blastocyst development? Like where? No, I don't think so. I think, I think you're, you're talking about, um, uh, the number of, um, and now keep in mind, I'm a urologist. <laughs> so you're dragging you're dragging me out into the deep end of the pool here a little bit um we do what we can okay yeah. <laughs> um now i think it's more uh in other words the number of of uh 
high quality eggs that you get when you do a retrieval. I mean, that's my recollection. Um, the, the number of, of oocytes that are being retrieved and the quality of those that are being retrieved. I'm not sure whether there's data, I'd have to check. There may well be data on embryo quality um, and, and pregnancy rates as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the broad breadth of it. Do you recall if they were using kind of the lower dosages of the melatonin, as you suggested, yeah. was, was helpful yeah. for sleep versus two yeah, yeah, dosages absolutely. that are all over the place? No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, those five milligrams, 10 milligrams of, of melatonin, those are sort of supraphysiologic doses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so in terms of suppressing the pineal glands, normal secretion, you know, I think you, you run a greater risk of that when you start taking these high doses. Unfortunately, that's what's being sold. I mean, you know, people mm -hmm. think it's a mistake. Or it's always better, right? <laughs> right? A little bit is good, then more must be better. Exactly. Which is obviously not, a, not always the case. So, um, and, you know, I, I, I just think um, two milligrams, which is the dose that has actually been shown to be the most effective in terms of sleep, um, and, you know, I think that's probably uh, a good dose for other reasons as well. Hey, Mark, sort of an add on to this is not specifically about melatonin, but, you know, you talk about how this basically potentiates the effect if you use it with inositols and metformin. And, and this is a little off topic, but I get a lot of people that are on like multiple, multiple supplements. And since you're an expert in this area, what, what do you think is the right number of, I mean, because if you're on 25 supplements, you're probably not absorbing all those. So what's, what's the right number? And so people can kind of hone it down to the ones that are most important. Oh boy. I, you know, you read about these uh, longevity experts who take like literally a handful yeah. of supplements every day. Uh, personally, I think that's sort of a little crazy. Um, yeah. I don't know that I can tell you an actual number. Um, I do know that there are some fertility programs around the country that literally hand out a, a long list to mm -hmm. both the male and female partner. And they'll say, okay, you guys are going to take all of the, you're going to take all of these and you're going to take all of those. Um, it makes me nauseated just thinking about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the person who, when they come to me with their giant, you know, like two gallon bag full of supplements, yeah. I'm like, we are going to simplify. We are, yeah. we are going to like, these are the things let's, let's get this down to kind of like the two to four most important things. And let's yeah. focus on this. That's kind of where I, I shoot for about five is what I try and pare it down to. Cause I agree. I think. I think too much is not good. I think you need to pick the ones you want, but I don't have any data about that. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is that, that, um, I don't think we have 20 things that we actually have data that supports that, that it's actually helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't know how to choose, um, sort of the best products. They don't know yeah. how to choose the best form of a product. Okay. You know, what's important in many instances is not, how much you ingest it's how much you absorb okay yeah. mm -hmm. um and a lot of products are not well formulated um there are certain nutrients that are hard to absorb um and if they're delivered in the wrong uh form uh, of if it's a soft gel a capsule a tablet um a gummy god forbid uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh then then you may not be absorbing it um or you may not actually even have the uh, active form of the nutrient um, available. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a it's sort of a, a tricky it's a tricky process to to make your way through. So how do you know if you're doing you know let's say some of the big heavy hitters like you're taking inositol and CoQ10 and melatonin like how do you know what to take when to take in in what kind of amounts like where do you reference that besides having to go back to all the original literature which is not uh, that is not a fun read um no it's not and i mean the um so part of what what we do okay at at you know the company that i work with um is to try and parse that literature and sort of digest it and present it in a way that sort of makes the most sense. Um, we have always, for instance, we have always had a philosophy that 
form has to follow uh, formulation. You can't put the form of a product first. In other words, uh, you know, go back to the gummy question. Um, <laughs> you can't you 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 can't put certain things into a gummy. The perfect example is the fact that there are no gummy prenatals that contain iron. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And iron, you know, especially once you're pregnant, iron is one of the most important nutrients that should be in a prenatal, but no gummy prenatal contains any iron. Mm -hmm. um, and calcium too is a big one, right? Calcium. Yeah, right. You can't, you can't cram that much into a gummy because most of the gummy is just, it's a candy. Um, mm -hmm. and so you're limited as to what you could put in there. Um, you're also limited. Another great example is coenzyme Q10, CoQ10 for egg quality. Okay. Um, very big fat soluble molecule and it's really hard to absorb um from your gi tract um mm. and so there are some forms of coq10 which you literally will absorb none of from a from a pill so if a hard tablet a powdered form of coq10 the absorption is going to be like one or two percent of the dose oh wow um, wow a soft gel on the other hand which has an oil carrier typically in it more easily absorbed okay uh mm -hmm. even more easily absorbed than that would be an oil carrier with an emulsification agent added to help the body absorb it um mm -hmm. and so all of those things are kind of like the fine points which because as somebody much mentioned a, a moment ago the supplement world's not really regulated by the fda not in any mm -hmm. kind of uh comprehensive way um and so it's it's really buyer beware uh, and, and there's a lot of product being sold that has little benefit. Um, and so back, back to the melatonin. So there, I mean, I know I've like you guys for melatonin have, it's like a little chewable thing. Um, I've seen melatonin as gummies. I've seen it as gel caps. I've, you know, it comes in all kinds of different forms, right, right. kind of back to the melatonin. What, what, what is is that one of the more flexible items? It is. That's a perfect word for it. Flexible. Yeah. <laughs> melatonin, mel melatonin gummies are fine. Okay. And the reason is because melatonin as a molecule is stable. Um, the only thing you need to put into that gummy, the only active ingredient in the gummy is the melatonin. Okay. Um, and, but here's a very interesting point, And that is when you make a gummy, the manufacturing process for making a gummy requires that this liquid uh, candy mixture gets heated up to about 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, okay? And so some of the nutrients that you might want to throw into a gummy are not going to survive that kind of heat mm -hmm. very well. Um, and so you've got to have testing done on the finished product to make sure that once it's gone through the manufacturing process, the active ingredient is still there and available. Okay. Melatonin, not a problem. So I'm curious just because I've, I've tried your melatonin. I love it when I'm traveling. Um, cause it does work amazingly well. Why, why did y'all decide on a chewable versus a gel or something else or just a pill you can swallow? Um, if you know, I'm just curious. I'm trying to remember. Um, I think it's the, it, it so here's a here's an interesting regulatory issue. Um, the definition of a dietary supplement, okay, is that it has to be absorbed from the GI tract. You take it mm. by mouth, and it gets absorbed from the GI tract. So if you created a product and you said this was a sublingual dietary supplement, okay, meaning mm -hmm. you put it under your tongue. And the idea being to, for it to be absorbed through the mucosa of the mouth directly into the bloodstream, the FDA could come after you and say, wait a second, that's not a dietary supplement. That's a drug. Because oh, the, wow. Yeah. The route of administration is weird. transmucosal, sublingual. So, but if you call something a chewable, okay, what happens is that you're getting a combination of absorption, both from the stomach and also some from oh, through, wow. through the mouth, okay? Um, and so this is this is something that the supplement industry will do um, to try and get quicker absorption into the bloodstream without calling a product sublingual, okay? Uh, yeah. Because technically you cannot make a dietary supplement and, and 
market it as a sublingual product. That is so cool. Like I never yeah. even thought of that. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that either. Yeah. Well, that's why it's a dietary. I like, um, there was a product that came out where you put it like on inside your mouth against your gum and the FDA, and they said it was a dietary supplement because you were putting it in your mouth and the FDA closed them down very quickly because no, that's huh. just absorption through the mucosa of the gum. And, mm -hmm. but if you say that this is being chewed and it is being chewed, part of it's getting down into the stomach, but some of it's getting absorbed more quickly. People who take melatonin for sleep, they want that effect, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So any other delivery of any other way, like, you know, like hormonal patches, any of that stuff is a drug. So it only if you put it in your mouth and swallow it, is it a supplement? Correct. Interesting. Right. So when you go back and you look at the prenatals, besides the iron issue, which uh, if someone's taking an outside supplement, are they likely to get all of the components of a prenatal that you need through a gummy? Or is it assuming that they're, they've are they got the USP and the NSF certifications? So the short answer is no. Um, okay. I mean, I'll put it, put it this way. If they have NSF and USP certification for the gummy, and there are some gummies that have gone through those certification programs what they're delivering is there. Okay. You can be reasonably certain of that. But you may they, be missing things. They've been independently certified. Okay. But the point is, if you look at that list, what they call a supplement facts label, mm -hmm. um, which is on the packaging, um, the list of nutrients is going to be much shorter and the amounts that they are able to provide are going to be much lower. So we mentioned the fact that iron just can't be in there. Okay. For reasons of both taste and production. Um, no, it, 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 it's gummy terrible tasting um and then you can't put calcium there are certain nutrients that are very bulky okay mm -hmm. um people always you know our our customers always want the long list of nutrients in a tiny little pill you know it's like can't you know and because pill size is important so when we're formulating products it's always a balance you're always trying to figure the trade-offs okay mm -hmm. You want the best formulation. You want a pill size that is not going to frighten people. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you don't want products that taste or smell badly. You know, if people put their nose in the bottle uh, and that's a challenge because there's a certain vitamin smell that people are always sort of looking mm -hmm. for. Worried Especially about. pregnant people not wanting to smell that vitamin smell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, no question about it. So, so the answer about, about gummy formulation is typically they are very, very limited in what they can provide. Um, mm -hmm. The list of nutrients is going to be shorter and the amount of each nutrient. Um, the other thing is the calories. I mean, uh, a, a reasonable size gummy and sometimes to get a, a reasonable number of nutrients, you need to take two a day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's 30, 40 calories every day, day in, day out. Um, it's sort of like drinking... It's like basically drinking a couple of cans of, of Coke a week. Okay. Um, it's, it's, and it's lots of sugar. Um, so that's, that's the other issue. We produce capsules. We produce soft gels. We produce tablets. We produce powder. Okay. I mean, our uh, inositol product is, is a, a powder that's mixed with water. Um, we don't produce a gummy. And it's not because we couldn't, it's because, again, the form has to follow the formulation. The formulation's got to come first. Um, and if there are too many compromises uh, required, um, we, we won't do the gummy. That's basically how we've approached it over time. I, I'm curious on your inositols. Why did y'all choose the powder for that one? I love the background on this stuff. If you have, yeah, I mean the powder. The powder was because we were trying. For, well, we the 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 majority of the studies that have been published, mostly in Europe, um, have used four grams per day, four thousand milligrams um, of of inositol combination, myo and decairo inositol, and you could put those in. You could put that amount into capsules, but you'd be talking about somewhere between six and eight capsules per day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's a lot. It is. <laughs> uh, and again, it's 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 a trying to figure the trade off between um, sort of being user friendly uh, and delivering the product in a way that is 
um, bioavailable and tolerable uh, and and effective. So that's kind of why we chose the powder. Yeah. Mark, have you guys ever thought about, you know, there's a company out there who shall remain nameless that have really pared their prenatal vitamin down to like very few things. And I'm really surprised at the number of people I've started seeing that have found that vitamin somehow before they ever got to me with kind of based on what you're saying, have you ever thought about developing like a prenatal vitamin that's better for patients with PCOS or prenatal vitamin that's better for patients who need, you know, X, Y, or Z? as opposed to trying to be all things to all people and putting every single thing in every prenatal vitamin. Yeah, the, you know, look, I, I think the concept of supplementation, okay, um, is at, at, its, at its foundation, it's intended to supplement your diet. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are certain nutrients that are in prenatals that are in fertility products, okay, um, where you couldn't possibly get all of those things in your diet, okay? You can't mm -hmm. get that much CoQ10. You, um, you know, you want to supplement folic acid um, mm -hmm. uh, or folate, okay? Um, because uh, some people just don't get enough in their diet. Um, um, but the notion that someone can, like, so for instance, there's a company out there that makes a prenatal that changes with your trimester, Okay. There's a first trimester prenatal. There's a second trimester and then a third trimester prenatal. Um, and there really just isn't enough science to support that kind of mm -hmm. um, sort of granularity. Mm -hmm. I, but I, I have a question regarding that. So even Therologix has a, like a preconception version mm -hmm. and a yeah. conception version. How do those right. vary? The main, the main difference between the preconception and the conception, um, you know, our goal we really started with a preconception version because uh, most products that are sold on the drugstore shelf or back when prescription prenatals were uh, as popular as they used to be, uh, those were gestational formulations. Those were formulations that were built for um, a woman who was already pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and in the fertility world, um, some women are going to be taking a prenatal for three months, six months, you know, sometimes even longer. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So they, they, yeah. So they don't need all the extra iron. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, the, the concept of uh, one of the most important nutrients when you are pregnant is getting extra iron because iron deficiency, um, especially later in pregnancy is, is such a, a, a common thing. Um, the recommended daily allowance, what the government says a woman needs in terms of iron intake, um, if she's not pregnant, if she's just getting her period every month, is 18 milligrams per day. That's the RDA, okay? Once you're pregnant, it goes up to 27, okay? Ah. And there are a lot of prenatals out there, the gestational prenatals, especially the prescription ones that had like 50 milligrams of iron. Um, iron is one of the most difficult nutrients to tolerate in terms of the, uh, you know, it's got all these GI side effects. It can be terribly constipating. Um, in fact, there, there were prescription prenatals that used to combine uh, 50 milligrams of iron in their product, along with a stool softener. <laughs> they would throw it. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Right. That was, that was real popular too. <laughs> yeah. Because it was, it's so constipating, but our point was, you know, there are certain nutrients that if you're going to be trying to conceive for three, six, nine, 12 months. Okay. Um, you don't need all that iron. You don't yeah. necessarily need high dose DHA. That's a, the omega-3 fatty acid. Um, you, you do need folate or folic acid. Okay. Um, and, you know, so there's certain nutrients that once you become pregnant should increase. Um, our goal was to create a preconception prenatal fertility focused that would be inexpensive. Okay. And it's like, I think it's $33 for 90 days, you know, mm -hmm. delivered. It's, it's, it's pretty inexpensive. That's the basic um, uh, preconception prenatal. Then there's another one that's got high dose CoQ10 in it. Um, uh, you know, for women where we have egg quality issues that we're, you know, more concerned about. Um, so we took a preconception and gestational approach, but the idea that once you're pregnant, you know, there's a formulation that makes most sense for the first, trimester and then the second trimester and the third trimester there's just no data to support that it's marketing 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point that not everybody needs that much iron. You're exactly right. And, you know, hemochromatosis is actually not that uncommon, you know, in patients too, whether they know it or not. So um, I think that's a, that's a great uh, yeah. point to make. So looking at, because we've covered a huge range of, of topics. So it looks like <laughs> things to think about. Number one is if you're getting supplements, they need to be NSF USP certified so mm -hmm. that they've gotten that third party designation. Either one. Yep. More is not better right. in, in the supplement <laughs> world. Having all of them is not necessarily any more beneficial than having just a few select um, that particularly applies to folate and melatonin and iron yep. that gummies are not the be all end all <laughs> because it's hard to get what you think you're getting. So you need to be selective about that. And then, um, melatonin may improve egg quality. And it sounded like, was it two milligrams a day was kind of the, the sweet spot for that? Two to three milligrams is, is okay. a appropriate dose. Yeah. Okay. both for sleep and for, for the uh, fertility issues as well. Okay. Did I miss any of the big points? I don't think so. Yeah, good summary, Carrie. I like that. Thank you. I have, <laughs> I have been taking notes. I have yes, you have. On. I have my notepad ready. Yes. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming and giving us the benefit of all of your knowledge. We forever and always uh, appreciate that. And appreciate my pleasure. It, so. My pleasure. Okay, Learn guys learn all the background. So to our audience, thank you for listening. Be sure to tune in next week for more. Be sure to subscribe, leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear from you We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So hop on by and leave us a like or a follow and say hello. You can also visit us on fertilitydocsuncensored.com to submit questions. All questions will be answered on our podcast anonymously for our Ask the Docs section. So leave us some episode ideas. We'd love to hear from you. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.